coming this season on Rogue Life. Hey there, it's me, Benny Bowers. So, the world has been pretty crazy since the last time you saw me. That girl that I kind of have a crush on friend-zoned me hard. I mean, yeah, we sort of share a connection. But only in a way that you find between two good friends. Sometimes storytellers need help just a bit. I was detained and questioned by some secret government organization. Mr. Bowers, we have this footage of you with Miss Blake and Mr. Peterson huddled together for an hour outside of the building. The heroes are stuck and they can't escape. I infiltrated an apocalypse cult. The master must be released to bring back his power and strength to the chosen people through the enlightened veil. And I faced down a rogue AI. I'm all about creating new and interesting stories and entertaining. If it's just a bunch of puppets, but there's no one to watch the show, what's the point? Going back. Let's move forward. Oh, and let's not forget getting caught up in a full-on Broadway musical. With a trying to live my best life. Rogue Life Season 2 premieres March 25th, 2024 on your podcast app of choice. Please, please, I understand the Council of Seventy is concerned, but there is more. Let us return to the words of Alan Waura, Gallandale Nossiter. After our long and perilous journey, we settled into a comfortable routine. The advanced party continued its negotiations and deliberations in the castle on the sea, and the sloops which had escorted us into the North Hope Bay departed, without ever landing ashore. The entire mission was shrouded in secrecy, and I am not convinced the Nyx officers fully understood what we had braved the Tempest and the Hyperbole for. I observed one of the lieutenants in the advanced party, discussing his orders with the captain. They spoke in High Elvish, and so I could only understand a fraction of what they said. It is, of course, a sin for an Uruk to speak their tongue, and few would admit to knowing it. Being hard of hearing, I have never suffered under the suspicion of seeking or keeping unsanctioned knowledge. I am an honest Uruk, and I have never sought it. But over the years, working with the officers and being gifted in semaphore and other languages, I found it impossible not to watch their lips and attach meaning to their words. It was clear that the lieutenant did not understand the patriarch's intent. A negotiation without purpose or meaning, he said. Unsure of what he expected to gain, how to measure his success. No Uruks were allowed in the advanced party. Officers only. And so we busied ourselves about the ship, husbanding our stores and maintaining our weapons. Each and all of us who had not taken ablation found that even with our reduced number, we could not fill the hours in the day. Back and forth, back and forth, the officers went looking ever more confused with each visit to the shore. The Patriarch, continuing to deliver his benedictions to the crew, but never leaving the deliverance, waiting, watching, patient. His composure never cracked. The routine and boredom which set in over the months and which played on the nerves and discipline of the crew never seemed to move him. He would stand on the bow, our bowsprit jutting like a sword at the city in the distance. 
and he would watch and wait for hours, for days, impassive and unmoving, as if not a moment had passed by. After everything we had endured, most were relieved for the peace, even if they chafed against the boredom and monotony. When food stores began to diminish and our purser raised her concerns formally, she expected to be admonished. A light flogging or beating at least. But the officers seemed pleased. Unnaturally so. It appeared that our lack had granted them sudden purpose, and they entered their next round of negotiations without the confused and anxious faces that had adorned them in their previous visits. This cemented in my mind just how deep the mystery of our mission was to even the senior officers upon the ship. They had visited a foreign barbarian land without need and without want and were forced to talk idly without commission or intent. We had already gifted some of our powder weapons to the king who ruled this land when we arrived and so they knew that we had goods to trade when the advanced party returned, they were ruddy with fury. I had not seen before a Nick's curse so in the low Analorian tongue, cursing the name of the barbarian king. It transpired that they had offered very little in return for our weapons. These barbarians, who had not yet mastered black powder, and who wielded pig iron and feathered bow, determined that the valley were food was much greater than that of rifle and cannon. During the lieutenant's rant, he accused the vizier of bad faith, crafting a grand lie of starvation and scarcity across the entire land, of a blight which swept away farms. So reluctant was the vizier to part with the stores that he admitted, even in the king's greatest hour of need, when he was besieged by a mutinous and riotous citizenry, he could not trade the precious food supply. The lieutenant even went as far as to propose that we sweep away the king's enemies in exchange for supplies. Though I doubt the patriarch knows of such an offer. He would seldom allow the Uruk marines and sailors to gaze upon the city, let alone to step foot in it. It was here that I watched the lieutenant disclose something for which I now carry the shame of knowledge. The vizier had told him that these barbarians, these barbarians, allow filthy creatures of all ilk and caste to touch the divine source, to wield the power of Analor. He said that the powder weapons offered very little that a velo caster could not, and whilst the weapons were plentiful in number, they offered little advantage. How barefaced this savage king was, to tell such bold lies. The famine and the blight was one thing, but to claim that anyone but the Nyx masters could touch the source, and to scorn our strength of arms, he must have taken us for fools. Such perfidy to try and gain advantage over us, as though we were just some other barbarian tribe. Or so I had thought at the time. It was late in the evening. The officers had convened with the Patriarch to ask him whether they should open negotiations with the King's enemies instead. I had relieved one of the junior rates from guarding the powder stores to free him to enjoy his name day with his new wife. The stores are in one of the most secure areas of the ship, and so allowing a deaf old Urukong guard every now and again has never been a concern. After all, we are not far from the Patriarch's quarters and his knowledge and awareness is absolute. I whittled away the evening, crafting a love spoon from wood from leftover barrels. These, newly wed, rarely lack the insight or foresight to bring gifts to their loved ones, or the patience and skill to craft a quality spoon. And so I take it upon myself to furnish them with this traditional gift, to present to their spouse on Kalia which would arrive eleven days after the moonless sky. The evening had seemingly passed without incident, and when the Patriarch was escorted to his quarters by a junior lieutenant, 
I was in the process of being relieved of my watch. I was caught off guard by what happened next. The young marine who had come to relieve me, his eyes suddenly widened with surprise, and he fumbled to draw a pistol. A grave crime to draw a weapon in front of the Patriarch. I was not thinking at the time. I simply saw him draw his weapon and I reacted, knocking it to the ground before he fired his shot. This was a mistake. A mistake I believe I will never be forgiven for. My intervention had caused the Marine's pistol to fail to fire. Fire at a shadow in the corner which had caught his attention. All chaos broke loose. I was knocked to the ground by the Marine as he advanced on the shadow, but he stopped suddenly, paralyzed, a bolt protruding from his neck. It was but a moment, and then, and then they were all around us. These barbaric, malformed creatures. Hideous mockery of nicks with rounded eyes, rounded ears, and pointed faces, made in contempt of Analor's image. They were upon us in moments. The junior lieutenant managed to graze one of the pinkish monstrosities with his blade before he was felled. I scrambled to my feet, but found myself under the vicious boot of one of the creatures who stamped his weight into my skull until there was only darkness. I do not envy the fates of these barbarians who face the Patriarch alone. Though I wish I knew the tale to share. What passed next was a maelstrom of shadow and light which danced across my eyelids and in the fancies of my mind. I recall the feel of the wind. I recall the spray of the sea. I recall the unmistakable deep report of cannon fire, which can shake bone even at a distance in the alcoves of my mind. But I remember more than anything. I recall the cold, the wet, as my throat and lungs were drowned with briny depths. And I recall waking, surrounded by wounded and ailing. I somehow found my way to my feet in the alien environment and wandered through the corridors of its edifice. Even in my confusion, I was struck by the raw, haunting beauty of its design. In front of me, a swirling staircase with perfectly crafted curve. A sculpture worthy of Analor, I thought at the time. But my stupor was broken by a dawning realization. The halls filled with the wounded, the smell of blood and ale heavy in the air. There were otherwise polished floors and pristine walls with spatterings of blood and night soil, lined with cots in rows, curtains separating the wounded from passers-by. I peeked behind the curtains, fearing to find my wounded comrades, but I found myself amongst the fleshy malformed creatures, kin of those who had assaulted my ship. I was still dazed and unsure if I had found myself in a dream or fascinations of my mind's desire. Each section of the room was a tableau of agony and hope. The rushing of hideous pink and brown Nixian mockeries, a relentless beat to the moans of the sick and injured. I looked down to gaze at my own visage, to determine the state of my own injuries. I wore little cloth, other than the meager modesty garb. My uniform was nowhere to be found. I wandered back to the cot I had risen from, filled with anxiety, trepidation, fear and confusion. The barbarians barbaring around me, their lips flapping with their ugly tongue at me, still unsure of reality. My skin prickling with cold dread, and my head swimming and thumping from concussion my throat hoarse and silenced by the brine which caused my chest to ache and burn. At the foot of my cot lay only a carved wooden spoon and my journal. I tried with all my might to make sense of what was happening, but my mind was drowned in pain and confusion. 
until I once more felt the distant report of cannon fire echo in my bones.